Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, this is the second part of the two part um, series we're doing about presentation, about standing up and speaking. Last week I talked more about how we present ourselves um, in general in life and how we present ourselves and give an image of ourselves in speaking and in in a lot of things we do. And I also talk a bit about how, um, how to stop yourself having panic attacks and how to um, calm yourself down when you're giving speeches, etc. Uh, so, but this week I wanna, I'm gonna focus more on the specifics of an individual speech and, and uh, an individual thing. Now, um, I'll come back to, uh, Still people coming in, which is good. Anyway, uh, I want to come back to, uh, so I've got this, this presentation on making a speech is two things. Making a speech is actually firstly writing yourself a good speech. Or if you can write it, being confident enough that you can extemporize a good speech and make it up as you go along. Um, some people are very good at that and particularly uh, when we're doing radio or television, uh, for example, if we have to talk about um, a major public event that we're televising, where we're waiting for all kinds of dignitaries to turn up, and then we, or, or if we're doing sports commentary, we basically have to extemporize. We have to make it up as we go along. We can't have a script. We might have a general script that says, oh, this person we're introducing now was born here, you know, and so on. But you have to, you don't know how long things are gonna take. You have to make up. So in Britain, for example, when there's a coronation, when there's an event involving royalty, our presenters have to be able to talk as they go along. Uh, Hong Kong at the Rugby Sevens, for people who like rugby, uh, they have to be able to talk as they, as they go along. So extemporization can be a very important aspect of speech writing. But the, for the sake of this exercise, um, we want to talk a bit more about something you've constructed, particularly when you're going to uh, make a presentation with it. You might intercut it with PowerPoint, et cetera. So I want to come back out to this at the moment. I, I don't want to get too much into the history of speech making and the history of rhetoric etc. Uh, but, you know, it's quite an interesting study. The, the, the concept of the importance of rhetoric goes back in, in Western culture, goes back to the Bible. Supposedly, Moses was complaining that he doesn't have enough words to deliver uh, God's word properly to people. Um, the ancient Greeks believed hugely in rhetoric, that you'd have to get up and argue your argument in front of the Senate, in front of the, the sort of um, the ruling group of people at the time. So the ability to, to argue publicly was very important to the Greeks and the Romans, actually. Uh, so there is a history about that. And, and I only want to go into the history insofar as it might be a bit relevant to uh, certain aspects of speech making. So let me just share this a minute. So come back to here. Let's give it a full screen. Okay, so, um, you know, part of making your speech effect, there are a few aspects about it. Some of them are in the writing, some of them are not. They come in different areas. So for public speaking, it's not like, in a way, it's kind of like conversation. In another way, it's not like conversation. It's, it's in conversation, you can actually try to persuade people, uh, but you tend to be, there's, there's give and take there. The difference between conversation and a public speech tends to be that in a conversation, both of you can talk and both of you can, can hear so that the, the verbal component of speaking is equal for both of you. 
Now, in a public speaking situation, there's still a conversation. But in a public speaking conversation, one of you is talking and the other one is conversing by their body language, by their attentiveness, by how much they, they seem to be interested in what they're saying and who they are. Like I said before, um, speak, a very interesting exercise for speech making that one particular professor, uh, David Jolliffe, recommended was write your speech. Now, write it as if you're delivering it to this group of people. And then he said, OK, now write your speech as if you're delivering it to that group of people. And that's one of the things we tend to forget very easily when we're talking about making presentation, that different audiences require different approaches and different conversation. So it's always a good exercise to get students or people who want to learn speeches, write a speech for um, this group, write a speech for that group, write a speech for people who to, you can persuade of different educational levels, of different minority groups, of different genders, and see how your speech changes. Then you realize very much that it is more of a conversation. And you know, you we can't do it easily on Zoom because people don't like to show their faces. But normally when you're doing a public speaking, you can see if people are bored, if they're yawning, uh, if they're standing with their arms crossed, which means basically, I don't want to listen to you, you know, I'm blocking off things from myself, these kind of things. So these are important. So speeches, we would talk quite firmly, formally, uh, most of the time. Uh, it doesn't matter so much if we use slang or poor grammar or even swear words so much in conversation. But if you do it in deliberate speeches, um, it's different. You know, so there's a formal thing which is going on, which is different. Um, so the first, you know, like I said, audience is important. Who are they? Don't stereotype them exactly. Always be aware of what's going on in the room. Again, this one matters so much to our presentations, um, which we're going to record and submit on PowerPoint or Zoom in the end. But you know, you have to think about these things. How old are other people in your audience? What's their culture? There's a very different thing between, um, even in terms of a teacher dealing with students, dealing with students in a sort of minority area of Los Angeles is going to be very different from dealing with students, typical of the students we have at Chu High College or at the Hong Kong universities. Uh, for one thing, um, uh, compared with any Western school or college, uh, students in Hong Kong are very well behaved <laughs> and less confrontational, I think. So, you know, you can deal with issues. You've got audience things to think about, including race, the gender, their occupation. Who are they? What's their political stance? Do you want to walk into the lion's den? If you're very pro-Democrat, do you want to walk into the lion's den and take on a whole bunch of Republicans? Or are you speaking to like-minded people? So, like I said, generally, um, in, in terms of the conversation that you have when you're giving a public speech, it's about the conversation that comes back to you is very visual and verbal cues in the room. And that's kind of um, what you respond to. If, if it's not working, you go on and you, you try and make your conversation another way. Try and wake them up. Uh, so. This goes back hundreds of years, actually thousands of years. This idea that the environment in which you're giving the speech is important. And I'll come to that in a second, uh, to the history of it. Um, so you've also got to think these days about context. Um, and I found this, you know, even with, with some of the students I teach. Once upon a time as a teacher, I could probably assume that the male was the norm um, and that I can talk about um, chief executives being male and I can talk about men totally in the conversation. Then I have, then as time progressed, people started to realize, oh, we better include females as well in our speech. These days, um, people are more recognizing of a range of sexualities or a range of genders. So, you have to be even more careful about that. In a lot of classrooms, you won't talk about male and female. 
you will you will actually get into trouble with some people if you do. And I've had students who don't identify as either who would feel very excluded. And if I did do that, so you know, this is a an aspect that we have to think about. In terms of speeches, I began to mention this last week, what are the kind of speeches there are? There are informative speeches like this one, hopefully, where I try to give you some advice about how to do things based on information. There are persuasive speeches like a politician might give. We're having um, local elections in the UK right now. So a lot of people are giving, um, they're trying to give persuasive speeches, trying to persuade people. So you find these two things, um, you know, they're, they're not exactly the same. And then there's special occasion speeches. Now, this, now, any of these speeches, probably not informative speeches, but if I'm trying to give a persuasive speech, a political speech, or I'm trying to give a special occasion speech, I'm more likely to use emotion and to use feeling in my speech, to use, uh, to use the old Latin word pathos. So this is the, the sort of important thing. So informative speeches, can be about objects, events, concepts, um, and that's in a way that's kind of easy to do. Persuasive speeches, I'm trying to persuade an audience to my point of view. Now, of course, if I'm trying to persuade you, I'll give you information as well, but, but it's a kind of different balance in terms of the thing. Ethos, and when I'm trying to give a persuasive speech, the idea of ethos is important, and I'll come back to ethos a bit more later. Ethos is credibility. Ethos is ethics. Ethos is morality. So one, one issue is, is my speech credible? Is it ethical? Is it moral? The other issue is, as soon as I stand in front of you, <coughs> or based on your past experience of me, <coughs> do you believe that I am credible? Do you believe that I'm moral? Do you believe that I'm ethical? Within British politics at the moment, for example, the big problem that the prime minister is having is nobody believes him anymore because he's been caught out so many times. And again, this is not even a political thing. This is actually times when this person has been caught telling untruths. When you, you get into this habit of telling untruths, people don't believe you have ethos or credibility. So informative speech, we're talk, trying to inform you about a specific topic. Persuasive, we want you to go and do something. A persuasive speech is more likely to have a call to action at the end. We'd actually be trying to get you to sign up, give money to charity, take part in a protest, run for office, vote, whatever. That's the call to action. So that's kind of more of the important aspects of this. Special occasion speeches, uh, yeah, you might, it might be a wedding, like I said last week, it might be a christening, it might be a funeral. You actually have to decide which of these things you're going to do, and it can be emotional. Uh, I mean, funeral speeches can be uh, emotional too. Funeral speeches uh, can be informative too. I, I've seen a lot of funeral speeches in the UK where basically it's been like a recap of the person's life, a celebration of the person's life. So, you know, these things are all come about there. So I said rhetoric's got a long history and I'm not gonna go into it in a lot of detail, but Plato called rhetoric the art of enchanting the soul, winning people over by talking to them. Aristotle calls, calls it um, the faculty of discovering all the available means of persuasion. Cicero says that rhetoric, speech making, is, is comprised of five less, lesser arts, inventio, dispositio, elocution. So this is invention, disposition, how you present yourself, elocution, memory, and how you pronounce things, how you actually say them, things. Rhetoric is speech design. Uh, Quintilian just said, rhetoric is the art of speaking well, or good man, let's say person, good person speaking well. Um, again, this is why I say your presentation of yourself is important. If people are going to believe you're a good person speaking well, 
they have to believe you're a good person in the first place. So that becomes a sort of issue there. Um, Francis Bacon says, you know, apply reason to imagination to, to move the will better. So now this, um, again, this looks, again, I'm not asking anybody to remember this or go into this, but, but it's one of the things I want to talk about here because we come back to it later. This looks very theoretical. This is a professor, David Jolliffe, who worked out this framework for um, rhetoric and giving a speech. So in his framework, these things, the rhetorical situation are exigent. That means, why are you giving this speech? What's the purpose? What's the function? Why are we here? The second one, like I just said, is audience. Who are the audience? Why are the audience uh, important? Like I said, if, if it's a different form of audience, do it in a different way. The next one is purpose. Oh, oh, let me go back. Next one is purpose. What's the purpose of my speech? Is it informative? Is it uh, persuasive? Now, then below that, there are different things you can appeal to within speech. Logos is appealing to logic. So that's an informative speech. That's one where I'm using logical argument. Ethos is uh, appealing to morality. Pathos is appealing to emotion. So if I want to inflame racist feelings, you will find that people who want to inflame racist feelings, for example, we use pathos a lot. They'll use the arguments of trying to push up people's emotions. Now, in all of these things, um, story is quite important. And story is a very basic thing of mankind. Most of the effective speeches I've seen, a lot of the effective speeches I've seen, rely on story. And I've talked about logos, pathos, ethos, the interesting thing is that science shows us that these things are actually scientifically relevant and that they, they affect us in different ways, that they make us, um, they make us, let me get this over, okay. they make us uh, respond in different ways, they release different hormones. And story is very important. Story is a very important way of doing this. I have this one TED talk made by this guy who specifically is talking about the ways in which these um, elements actually coalesce and, and affect us on a physical level, on a chemi chemical level. <laughs> In 2009, a man, a journalist, by the name Rob Walker, wanted to find out is, is storytelling really the most powerful tool of all? And in order to do this, he went on his computer and he bought 200 objects from eBay. And the average price of the objects were about $1. He then called 200 authors and he asked them, hey, would you like to be part of the significant object study? Which means that I would like to write a story to one of the objects. And 200 authors said yes. So there he had 200 objects, he had 200 stories. And I assume that it was with nail biting anticipation that he went on eBay again with all the 200 objects. Would there be a difference? Would there be a change? Do you think there was a change? One of the objects was this, this beautiful horse's head. There we go. The beautiful horse's head. Now, this beautiful horse's head was bought for 99 cents and was sold when the story was added for $62.95. That is a slight increase of 6,395%. So was this a one-off situation? Not really, because he bought the 200 objects for a total of $129, selling them for $8,000. Now that's insane. But you know what's even more intellectually challenging to understand is how can you and I go to the movies and pay good money to watch 
movies like James Bond, who are absolutely unrealistic. And we sit there, we enjoy the movie. And some of us, we really enjoy the movie. And we leave the theater going like, God, what a man. <laughs> I would like to be more like him. I'd like to walk like him. I'd like to talk like him. I like Bond. Wonder how I could be more like Bond. And then this weird revelation hits you like from nowhere and you come up with a brilliant idea to walk to a watchmaker shop. And wow, it just happens to be an Omega watch in that shop that resembles the one that Bond was wearing in the movie. And you pay $10,000 to put that watch on your wrist and you leave that store feeling more like Bond. How is that possible? PQ Media, tells us that $10.5 billion is turned over in product placement revenue every single year. How is it possible for you to be so easily tricked by something so simple as a story? Because you are tricked. Let me just stop that very briefly there. I'll give you one interesting point in connection with this. He's talking about how, you know, you can put a good a watch onto James Bond and so on. Do you know one way? I'll tell you one way to tell if somebody in a movie is a good guy or a bad guy, if it's a mystery. If that person is using a Mac computer, if they're using an Apple computer, they cannot be a bad guy. Because Apple, like a lot of organizations, wants to get its products into movies in order to promote them and in order to sell them better. And it will not allow any bad guy in any Hollywood movie to use an Apple product that it's sponsored. So they are well aware, if you know this is not fanciful, they are well aware that of the value of identifying their product with a good guy or a bad guy in a movie and how important it is. And they're not doing this out of a moral sense, they're doing it out of a simple sense of um, self-preservation and making money and making profit. So, it, you know, this is one of the one of the things to bear in mind. I may have spoiled a whole load of movies for you there, but but basically, when you have um, this is this is a deliberate principle of of Apple, or at least was. So let's get back to uh, David Phillips here. Well, it all comes down to one core thing, and that is emotional investment. The more emotionally invested you are in anything in your life, the less critical and the less objectively observant you become. And the greatest emotional investment of all is falling in love. Now, falling in love resembles a good story. Do you remember the last time you fell in love? Do you? Good for you. It's a beautiful feeling, isn't it? Do you remember how you longed and how you yearned and how you dreamt? And then you looked at her and maybe you thought, God, I love the way you chew that apple. <sighs> so crunchy. <laughs> oh, and the way you slurp that tea just over the edge, you know? <sighs> oh, it's so sexy. Love it. And then about 13 months later, when you biochemically fall in out of love, 13 months later, on an average, you fall out of love. Suddenly, you find yourself sitting in the sofa and you go, Jesus Christ, where did this thing come from? Oh my God, and where are my friends? This is a weird thing. And then suddenly you hear a sound. You go like, what's that? You go over to the kitchen and you look and you go like, oh, it's you. You're eating an apple there. <laughs> Could you just keep that down just a little bit? Yeah, you're kind of spraying the table there. Please, please don't. And you sit down comfortably again, and just a minute later, you hear somebody drinking tea from the kitchen going, <laughs> and suddenly, this is all annoying to you. Have you been there? Sadly enough. 30 months later, our critical thinking and our cortex comes home from a one year long vacation, and we start questioning things. Now, during those 30 months, what happened was that your brain was flooded with neurotransmitters and hormones hijacking your cortex, throwing your objectively observant skills out of the window. 
And the thing with the storytelling is that the same thing can happen. In stories, the same hormones and neurotransmitters can be released. Hormones like vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins. And do you know what? That's what I would like to do during my talk. I would like to induce three hormones into your brain. I call it the angel's cocktail, so it's a nice cocktail. I would like to start with radically increasing your dopamine levels. And I, I need your consent on this. Is it okay? Cool. If you don't like the idea of that, you'll just have to cover your ears. So dopamine, this is what it looks like. And when you have that in your blood, these are the beautiful effects. You get more focus, more motivation, and you remember things in a better way. So what does dopamine feel like? It feels like this. About six years ago, I received a phone call from a woman who represented one of the biggest training companies in Scandinavia. And she said, hey, David, we've got a lot of trainers in presentation skills and in rhetorics, and we would like to increase the level of all of these. And when you think you are a perfect pick, would you like to come to a meeting? I'm like, wow, I'm honored. I'd love to. And I come up to Stockholm, and I'm going to their office. And just as I am going to pull the handle down, what I don't know then is that I'm walking into one of the absolute worst meetings I am ever going to have in my life. But I don't know that yet, so it's okay. I open the door and I meet this woman. Her name is Liana. And hurriedly she says, David, just so you know, I'm not the one you're going to have this meeting with. You're going to have it with three gentlemen uh, further on here. And I'm like, okay, that's a bit strange. Uh, usually you know who you're going to have the meeting with. And then she progresses with a bit of chit-chatting. And then suddenly she says, are you, are you ready now? And I'm like, yeah, what should I be ready for? And then she says, just, you know, can you see the room over there? And I go like, yes, I can see. It. Well, in that room, you have the three gentlemen. Just so you know, they're all majority owners of this company. They've all got an ex-military background. And uh, none of them wants the training that you are going to pitch. I'm like, come on. What, why am I here? And it's like, well, all the trainers want this. But the management are on too high horses. They can't see that they need it. So it's pretty simple. The only thing you have to do is go in there and, and kind of, you know, just prove the opposite. I'm like, yeah, that sounds simple, doesn't it? And I can remember myself. I'm walking towards this office. My sweat is coming down my palms. My heart is racing. And just halfway there, uh, she calls my name. And I still, to this day, don't know if this woman is sadomasochistic or just downright unintelligent. Because she calls my name and she goes like, David. And it's like I'm going to get a tip, you know, something like that. So I turn around to ask it go like, and she says the following. If I don't tell you what she says there, is that annoying? <laughs> well, actually, as an example, I'm not going to do that. I just wanted to prove to you what it feels with high dopamine levels. Would you say that your focus was increased? Your attention was increased? You were creative. You created situations around this, and you probably already figured out what that room looked like, correct? And you remember that I did that to you for quite a while. Now, the feeling you had there was high levels of dopamine, which is beautiful. So how do you do that? Well, what you do is you build suspense, you launch a cliffhanger, and the most beautiful thing of all is that all storytelling is, per definition, dopamine creating, because it's always something that we're waiting and expecting. So just imagine, just by using storytelling, you can get those techniques. You don't have to do a cliffhanger like I did. So that was the first hormone. I'd now like to go to oxytocin. Is that okay as well? I'll induce that. All right. The beautiful effects of oxytocin are the following. You become more generous, you trust me more, and you bond to me. Do you want to do that? All right. All right, so this was uh, nine months have passed. And... Uh, it's a planned cesarean. And the little brother who was five years of age at that point of time, he was kind of really looking forward to what's going to be, what's going to happen. He was going to become a big brother. And he'd helped us pick out the wallpaper. He'd helped choose the bed linen. He'd even saved his own pocket money to buy a little stuffed animal, which was placed on the pillowcase. And about two days before the planned cesarean, something happened. 
something wasn't right. The parents couldn't, something was off. And the day before, there was simply no movement in the stomach. There was no heartbeat. You couldn't feel or hear anything at all. So the parents were rushed into hospital, lay down on a bed, and the doctor comes in, checks the stomach, looks at me and sees what I see, and that is that the heart is no longer beating this child. This was me nine years ago. It's the worst thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. And I don't know, Jude, can you just imagine what you have to tell, a how you tell that to a five-year-old? Can you just imagine that? Because he's home there waiting anticipation for this coming event. But it won't happen. So part of me, and to handle that, I talk about it. And I've talked to you about it now. And now you've got higher levels of oxytocin in your blood, whether you want it or not which means that you feel more human. You're bonding to me and you feel more relaxed. So how do you do that? In storytelling, you create empathy. So whatever character you build, you create empathy for that character. And oxytocin is the most beautiful hormone of all because you feel human. Now the third and last hormone is endorphins. And I would like to show you a woman which we can say has overdosed on endorphins. Let's just look what that looks like. Oh, we'll go here. To inspire and to respond. Are you speaking or listening? <laughs> 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 to inspire and to respond. To inspire and to respond. And in all circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> and in all circumstances. Of our life together. <laughs> I'm sorry, of our life together. Of our life together. To be loyal to you. With my whole life. And with all my being. And with all my being. Until death practice. Until death practice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the timing of that is so lousy, isn't it? So how do you create endorphins? Well, you make people laugh. What happens then is that they become more creative. They become more relaxed, and again, they become more focused, which is beautiful to have. Now, all these three hormones that I've induced into your brain now is what I call the angel's cocktail. But there is an opposite of that cocktail, and I call that the devil's cocktail. And the devil's cocktail has high levels of cortisol and adrenaline, and they feel like this. Ah! Sorry to do that to you. So high levels of cortisol and adrenaline. And the problem with that is that if you've got really high concentrations, which I didn't give you there, but when you've got high concentrations, look at this. Is this something that you want to have the people you talk to have in their blood, in their system? Hmm. Now, in our stressful work lives, in our stressful lives, many times, when you present, when you communicate, when you deliver meetings, which one do you think they've drunk most of? The devil's cocktail or the angel's cocktail? Most commonly, the devil's cocktail. And the problem then is that you've got all this to work against. But all of that can change today. All of that can change by you starting to use something I call functional storytelling. And functional storytelling means that you do these three things. One, you have to understand that you don't have to be a bearded old man in front of a fireplace with a dark voice in order to be a great storyteller. In my experience, when I train people, everybody is a good storyteller from birth. The only problem is that you don't believe in it. The second thing is this, write down your stories. You'll notice that you have three to four times more stories in your life 
than you normally or than you thought that you had. Three, index those stories. Which of your stories make people laugh, i.e. create endorphins? Which makes people feel empathy, i.e. oxytocin? And the next time you go into a meeting, you pick the story you want to release the hormone you wish in the person that you're talking to to get exactly the desired effects that you wash, want. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, you know me, some of you know me as Mr. Death by PowerPoint. And uh, I want to round off with making my point very clear. And my point is this. 100,000 years ago, we started developing our language. It's sound to say that we started using storytelling to transfer knowledge from generation to generation. 27,000 years ago, we started transferring knowledge from generation to generation through cave paintings. 3,500 years ago, we started transferring knowledge from generation to generation through text. 28 years ago, PowerPoint was born. Which one do you think our brain is mostly adapted to? Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, there's, there's one, one area there where, where um, I don't totally agree with you because I, I think we have to realize why do we go to see scary movies? Why do we get on roller coasters? Why do we do all these things? In fact, what he calls the devil's cocktail can have its value, a great deal of value, if we actually use it and resolve it. We can be terrified being on a roller coaster, but at base, we know we're probably going to get off it alive. I'm never totally convinced about that, but we're probably going to get off alive. If we're going to see a movie and we are put into these dangerous situations in the movie, we're not getting the angel's cocktail there. We're getting the devil's cocktail. We're getting these, these fearful emotions opened in us, but the movie resolves them. If the movie doesn't resolve them, we feel very antsy and very frustrated when we come out. So it's not the case really that you can never use uh, tension or you can never use threat or you can never use scary things in a presentation. Uh, it's really that you have to resolve it. You have to bring it back into the positive thing, take people on a ride and then bring the whole thing back. Um, and you know that the, the point is, I think he shows quite convincingly there that in terms of like selling those objects, the story thing works well. In terms of selling things in movies, story works well. And you may wonder how much you can use story. But the interesting thing is to me that a lot of these things actually go back a long way and, and, and tie together with old theories about, um, storytelling and about giving speeches and about things like this. So if we come back to this, logic means I'm actually trying to pursue you, persuade you by presenting an argument. So I can use, you know, if, then, therefore, this kind of arguments there. This is what Aristotle and others referred to as logos. Oh, I, don't, I don't know, how, don't remember how to pronounce the G's, whether it should be hard or soft, but anyway. Logic is, is there. So here um, we're using um, logical argument. Now, the, the scary, scary thing is, the worrying thing is in a way that, hang on, let me come, come back. The scary thing is in a way that logic, um, logic can be countermanded by pathos, by emotion. Logically, we might actually say that the um, that racism is bad. But if I use pathos and try to convince you that all this minority group is harmful to you and damaging to you and tell you stories about this, then I can countermine the logic. 16, and you know, one of the things working in television, one of the things we know is that um, using emotion can be very dangerous. 60 Minutes Plus years ago did a story about this guy, white person, 
in South Africa who'd gone out into the city square with assault rifles and everything and just shot one black person after another for no reason. He just stood there killing black people. And the story 60 Minutes Plus was telling was that this guy had just been pardoned and released from prison despite murdering many people. And you're looking at, and so they interviewed uh, relatives of the people who'd been shot. They interviewed all these, these things and made you really, really angry at this situation, at this justice situation where this guy was released after murdering all those people. Then you watch this whole piece, you're furious, you're really angry this guy's been released somewhere towards the end of the report. They said in almost in parenthesis, so you didn't pay much attention to it. They said, oh, uh, by the way, this was uh, agreed as part of an amnesty agreement that we would no longer keep people who committed political crimes in prison because there had been many political crimes during apartheid committed by black South Africans. They, you know, killing others who they thought had actually been traitors, the traitors, the famous thing of necklacing people, putting, burning a tie around their neck, and killing them that way. So as part of this thing, the agreement was release all people committed to political crimes, not only white people, not only black people. But the point was that the whole feeling of that piece had got you so angry with the situation that it overcame your logic. And actually, 60 Minutes, very badly, I think, for a television organization, played down the logical argument, played down the reason for that whole thing. And you know, that's actually, um, you know, that's a danger with television. It's easier, and, and to, to forget any mass media, um, I sometimes think, you know, we feel we're living in a post-truth age in some ways, because emotion does get to trump logic and trump sensibility and trump ethos. So, you know, lo logic is um, one of the things which we should appeal to, and which, which is one of the more responsible things we can actually be um, trying to push as, as presenters or as as speakers. So that's one thing. Um, with logic, you have to be logical. You know, you consider this. Now, ethos is an attempt to persuade on moral grounds. This is ethical. This is right. This is good. This is the, the ethos. Now, ethos depends on you believing I'm ethical as a speaker or on anyone believing you're ethical as a speaker. That's important. And then there's pathos, which I've talked about. Um, and, you know, in, in my classroom sometime, I, I used to take care of lots of street cats um, and many of them we rescued, many of them we found homes, some of them had died, you know, and in the classroom, I've told the stories about these things and, and you instantly awaken pathos in people like he did by telling you the story about the, um, the miscarriage there by the, the child dying. So Aristotle's idea of the rhetorical triangle, uh, again, I'm not going to get too much into this, so don't worry about it too much, but it relates back to storytelling. It relates back to the main aspects of how to tell a story. So at the top, you have the speaker or the writer, ethos. So it's my job or your job as the speaker to make us think you are credible and trustworthy. We have to believe you. You can do this partly through your appearance, the way you speak, the way you deliver, your past, your history. Um, all this is important, but you do it partly through your writing, partly through the actual words you use. The ethos becomes important. Audience, uh, when we talk about pathos, if we, the reason why Aristotle puts pathos with the audience is that it's about getting the emotional response from the audience. This is about listening. 
to, now let me go back again. This is about getting people to listen, getting people to pay attention, responding to them, getting their feedback. And then Logos, Logos is actually, you know, basically trying to argue from a logical point of view. So this is important. And I said earlier, I gave you the Latin names for these different forms of um, delivery and different forms of attention. I want to come back to myself here a bit. Now, there are ways you do this. You do it in terms of how confident you look when you walk in, of course. Uh, one of the things in that film I just showed you is something I really recommend. There's, there's two ways of doing this. Like I said, I, I think that some of the people who came in to speak to us before, in certain situations, we give people a hand mic to carry. If you look at that speaker, he, he can sit down, he can move around. The most he's got, he's got a sort of remote control for the, the PowerPoint display for the slides, but he's got the ability to, to use his body, use his emotions, use his expressions. The other thing I want you to encourage you to do Again, based on last week, I talked to you about speaking. I talked to you about breathing, making sure you have enough breath. There's two good, two reasons for that. One is there's nothing scarier than having an anxiety attack or drying up in the middle of your speech. And suddenly you start to feel you can't breathe. You're not getting enough breath into your lungs. So that's one of the reasons I said oxygenate. You know, breathe deeply. Make sure you, you are highly, you have a lot of oxygen in your blood before you even start talking. That's one important thing. But the other thing is that you should oxygenate so you can project your voice. If you're in a room where you have, I, I've known a couple of stage actors. I used to live in a, a house where a, a famous English stage actor came to visit, my landlord. And you know, the minute this guy would walk into the house, you'd hear him two floors up and it would be good evening because he was a stage actor and he was used to talking on stage and it going all the way to the back of the theater, not using microphones. And this is one thing that actors are taught. Certain opera singers, are opera singers like um, Andrea, Andreas Bocelli, who's considered a very great opera singer, People actually say, this person can't do opera because they have this very fine, very delicate voice, but you put them on stage without a microphone and they don't have the projection, you know? So if you can, try to improve your speaking. Try to learn how to push the speech out there. If you can control the situation, and if you can control the situation, use a head mic like he was using. Uh, problem is, if you're doing it with presentation, sometimes you, you pop the mic and you get problems that way. But if you can control the situation, do it that way. And, you know, voice can be quite important. Uh, if you have a high voice, if you have a high pitched voice, we've had this situation in Hong Kong where news readers have come straight out of college, straight out of into TVB newsroom or wherever, and they sit there and they read the news. And they, particularly if they're female, they tend to have a very high voice and people, it may be a prejudice, but people don't buy the credibility of a high voice. We do have this innate feeling. So if you do, if you're one of these people who tends to speak, as I've said before, from the back of your nose, um, which is a very traditional thing in Cantonese opera, actually, to, to have your voice coming from very high up here. Um, if you try and do that, try and bring your voice down. Try and improve the depth. I just want to show you a short piece of film about how big a difference voice can make. And if you can do it, try and deepen your voice. Now, I've. you might be dubious about how possible this is, but it is actually quite possible. So take a look at this. In the right voice for Darth Vader was another challenge. Uh, action. Lucas had never intended to use the onset vocal performance of David Prowse. Start tearing the ship apart, please my feet, until you find those tapes. Find the passengers in this vessel. 
I want them alive. I can still hear David Prowse's accent in the Darth Vader mask muffled because he would do the real dialogue and trying to curse Carrie Fisher or something. Thank you. you know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic... You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. It was hilarious and terrifying at the same time because we didn't know what Darth sounded like. That was the first time we heard him. We're like, is that it? Is it going to be some Scottish guy or what is this? Prowse's voice would later be replaced with a more menacing performance provided by classically trained stage and film actor James Earl Jones. George had hired David Prowse, but he said he wanted a so-called darker voice and not, not in terms of ethnic, but in terms of um, timbre. And the rumor is that he thought of Orson Welles uh, and then probably thought that Orson might be too recognizable. So what he ends up is picking a, a voice that was born in Mississippi, raised in Michigan, and was a stutterer. And uh, that happened to be my voice. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take it away. So the point is, you're not going to have to sound like Darth Vader to give a speech, and it's probably better if you don't. But, but do try and give your voice power. You can do that with, with breathing exercises. You can do it by trying to bring your voice down into your throat, uh, in, into your chest more. Um, and, and if you can, you know, if you feel your voice is too trill, you know, when we're nervous, we all bring our voices up in pitch. Nobody who's relaxed takes their voice down to, you know, brings their voice up in pitch this way. Nobody who's nervous takes their voice down to a more relaxed, positive level. This is, this is a key thing. So when you think about presentation, think about how you look, how you present things, think about your voice. Now, one of some of the exercises I do with students, I do actually get students to do voice presentation only. And there was one, I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's quite long, but there was one person who, uh, a girl who was from France, who was in our college a few years ago. Um, no lie. Uh, and again, she doesn't have a particularly deep voice, but I just want, what I want to encourage you to realize here is the way she uses the voice in terms of emotion and the way she uses it in terms of making us sort of pay attention to it. So I'll just play a little bit. We can listen to it. No lie. As a Chinese in France. For those who don't know, I am a banana. I think a lot of people know this expression in Hong Kong as it is a cosmopolitan city. How about you? You know the meaning when I describe myself as a banana? Yes, my skin is yellow and I'm white in my heart, like a banana. I'm Chinese but I was born and raised in Paris, in France. My topic today is to share my point of view of France as a French-born foreigner. But I think this applies equally to any Asian who has grown up in a Western country. Right now in France, the Asian community is revolting against the insecurity, the thief, the violence, and the racism due to our skin color. Okay, I won't uh, play too much of that. Uh, it's a very good, well written, as a, one of the best that, that I've, I've had from a student. It sounds like a professional radio announcer. Okay, her voice is not powerful, but she's not actually telling the story from a powerful point of view. So she does tell us the story. There's a lot of stories in this piece. She tells us stories about encountering racism, about the kind of things people say in France, 
when it came to actually doing a presentation in front of the class, she told us how she'd been sexually assaulted on the underground metro in France. And she did that so emotionally and so powerfully. It was very hard to watch. Uh, she was very good at this. It's not only though about sounding like Darth Vader or having a deep voice or a full voice. It's about thinking about how do I use my voice in terms of sing song? How do I use it in terms of pause? How do I use it in terms of stressing words? And all of these issues are sort of quite um, key to, to delivery, to doing it. So um, I'm not going to go through all these things. I, you know, invention, like I said, basically uh, what we're going to say, how, how we come out to do it. Um, so a five paragraph essay model that we were taught in schools very often is introduction, statement of fact, confirmation, refutation, conclusion, a lot of scientific papers that I edit and attempts to get money for proposals take this form. Your final thesis may take this form. This is quite a sort of traditional way of doing a convincing piece of, uh, of persuasion, basically. So style, how do I pronounce it? Again, I wanna get on to other things, so I won't spend memory, speak extemporaneously. You know, the guy we just saw speaking, he doesn't have an auto cue. He doesn't have a script there. The worst thing to do don't read your PowerPoint. That's really not a good thing to do at all. Uh, get it into your head so you can remember it. If you can remember it, put a kind of auto cue or a caption up on your computer screen and read it, but don't look like you're reading it. You know, extemporization, make it sound like you believe in your words enough that you don't have to read them from a script. This is important. Delivery. Again, I just talked about voice. Greeks believe to be a good speaker, you have to be a good person. Um, again, anybody who, certainly people like me who really dislike our current British Prime Minister, uh, certainly know that he is not eloquent and he can't speak well. So this is quite important to us. But, you know, we do actually like to have people who can speak well. So how do we actually write for a public speech? You know, in some ways it's similar, in some ways it's different. So engage your audience. Now, one of, one of the ways to do that, try and get them on your side immediately, try and get them to pay attention to you. Put your ideas over in a logical manner. Although the, the thing we just saw, that speaker was using story quite a lot. In order to convince us of the value of speaking, of, of stories. He presented us that example of those objects that were bought and that sold more. That's logic. That's using logic to, to do it. That's using evidence to do it. Now it's a story and we wanted to hear the story and go all the way through, but logic actually was a convincing part of that, that argument that he was making. All right, so audience, like I said, think about your audience. One thing is, unlike with reading a book, your audience cannot go back and read the sentence again if they don't get it. They, if you're presenting for radio or television or writing any kind of script like that, people have only got one chance to follow your sentence. You can't write a Henry James sentence which takes up a whole page of a book because nobody will remember the beginning by the time they get to the end. Your speech needs to be well organized and easy to understand. So again, I've said to you, there are these different forms of speeches. So feeling, when we're doing eulogies, wedding speeches, we want to encourage people's emotions. Thinking, we want to, as lecturers or teachers, we want to stimulate listeners to think about the topic and go into it in a bit more depth in terms of getting people to act. We want to actually convince people to go out and take specific actions. Like I said, whether it's to vote, give money to charity or whatever. So how do we do that? We can actually use a few uh, simple writing tricks. One of them is 
uh, reversing things within con and contrasting things. This famous line from John F. Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do, I've lost a word here, for your country. People remember that line all these years later. You know, this, it's now 60 years since he said this, and that line is still remembered. Uh, you can use metaphors if you can use them in a not too contrived way. Uh, Kennedy's White House was called Camelot because people thought it, it was kind of Arthurian and idealistic. Ronald Reagan picked up on that and liked to refer to America as a shining city on the hill. It's got sort of religious overtones, you know, it makes all these things. Um, in the movie Say Anything, the valedictorian tells the students, you know, go back. Um, Robert De Niro gave a very good speech to um, Tisch School of Arts, where basically he says, congratulations, you've graduated, you know, you're doing really well. Now, um, now you're really messed up. He didn't use those words, but, but you know, he shocked everybody by saying, now the hard times begin. So these th things can work too. Think about the structure. Have a structure that keeps people going. The guy we just saw, the Dennis Phillips speech, he basically <coughs> has got the structure. I'm going to start with this. I'm going to tell you how... Uh, we make more money by using story, how we sell things by using story. I'm going to teach you what chemicals story arouses in people's body. Uh, don't go round in circles, particularly if you're only doing a five minute to 10 minute speech. You don't need to go round in, in circles. Uh, audiences do want to feel that you're going somewhere and you know it. With TED Talks, actually, there's a limit of 15 minutes for the talk. So that's kind of an important thing. If you're not sure about structure, if you think your story might be too unstructured, it's always a good idea. Um, if you think your audience's attention might wander, very often I would say, um, and even the scientific papers and the, the academic uh, attempts to raise funds, which I've read, people will say, well, you know, I have five points to make. And then you go, one, this, two, this, three, this. Now, then the audience knows, OK, I've only got to listen to five and then the lecture is over. So it gives people a timeline. It gives people a, a sense of how much there is to get through. Um, you know, I've got I've got a dozen things I want to say to you. Don't do a dozen. A dozen is not good. Uh, but give people a structure. So first, second, third. Um, and again, if you're doing first, second, third, don't say Firstly, second, and C, you know, keep the, keep the things operating in the same way. Don't say firstly, second, thirdly. Keep them operating in the same way. I just like first, second, and third myself. But give people that structure. It's very helpful to people. They do actually feel a bit more confident if you give them that kind of structure. Think very clearly about what's necessary to put across. In the opening, you could, should come in and get people comfortable. Uh, you can do, you know, you can actually, um, I, I found that uh, I've been to a couple of concerts and things which have been done by Indian artists. And one problem I found is that they are often opened by people who give long-winded speeches before the, the concert even talks. And they actually put people to sleep before it even starts. So again, think about your audience. Who is the audience? Why are they here? What do they want? How likely are they to accept me? How likely are they to believe me? So that's important. You can be personal. I mean, the Robert De Niro speech of the Tish thing begins with him blowing his nose because he, he, he basically was, uh, had an itchy nose when the thing started. You know, people, people will give you time to blow your nose or to get their attention if you want to. Sometimes you need to repeat. Sometimes you do need to actually remind people. Um, I think that it's quite kind of important when you're thinking about repeating, think about what are the key things I want to push? What are the key phrases? What are the key themes? Don't repeat irrelevant stuff. 
don't repeat stuff which was your way of getting from A to B, but do repeat A and B and C. Try and keep coming back to these things. This is one thing which is quite a useful thing. Um, don't do it to the, try not to annoy people too much, but you want people to walk away with your speech or your ideas in their head. You know, this is important. Use transitions, use rhetorical questions. What does this mean? You know, what, what do you think about this? Again, the speech we saw just now from the TED talk, he actually asks these rhetorical questions. So what do you think about that? So how do you feel now? He's not expecting a lecture back from everybody to explain it, but this is important. So here's the main point. Here's the lesson. This is a, what do we learn from that? You know, this is actually how to get people to perk up again and to pay attention a bit more. You can use props in theatrics. I can't really explain this here, but this guy called Stephen Covey was very good at this. He basically would uh, use a prop here. He would put rocks in it. He would put um, sand in it. He put pebbles in it, and then he would it was to really illustrate how we waste time on unimportant things in life and we don't actually focus on the big things first and then fill in with the unimportant things so it was a much more sort of organized way of doing it and end strong you know what's the you might want to do a very quick short recap you might want to decide decide on this uh you might want to sell it, share a story about how this all worked for somebody and then um, don't, and then make a call to action if it's like a persuasive speech. Keep it quite short. Again, um, I've often been asked by companies. Companies have said to me, uh, "Oh, can you make us a video to explain to people how our company works?" And I've said, "Sure." How long do you want it to be? Uh, Twenty-five minutes. I said who's going to watch your video for 25 minutes typically these corporate videos these company videos they're played in venues like book fairs or art fairs or trade fairs the audience is standing there on their feet they don't have chairs they don't have peanuts they don't have popcorn they don't have anything to distract them they're not going to stand on their feet for you to give us everything you want to say about your company for 25 minutes. So I, I advise people never make a sort of corporate video longer than 10 minutes because that's the limit you can expect it and presumably shorter. Again, the same thing can apply to speeches. Don't think a 25 minute speech is more worthwhile than a five minute speech. Definitely is not. Just fit everything in, you know, and it's a good discipline. You know, so again, your audience, what's in common with the audience, what's their age, what's their interests, what's their ethnicity, what's their gender, do they, are they as knowledgeable as you about your topic? One of the things we always do in television when we're interviewing people, um, I've interviewed a heart surgeon before and I filmed him doing heart surgery. And you know, it's complicated. It's quite complicated how to describe and explain heart surgery. One of the things we always do as interviewers is to, is to say, for the benefit of my audience, who may not know too much about medicine, how do you explain this? How can you explain this to a layman? And that's what it worked. Now, if I'm really giving a lecture to a group of heart surgeons, then I can use all the technical terms in the world. If I'm giving a lecture to a general audience, I don't get to use all those terms. Or if I try, people won't pay attention. In the speech we just saw, you have to explain what is oxytocin, what are endorphins, what are these things. You can't assume people know them. So you need to think very, very much about your audience. Like I said, it's always a two-way conversation. Why are these people here? What, what are they expecting you to give them? How detailed do you expect it to be? You know, we often in, in, in television say, uh, use sometimes very childish ways of explaining things. You know, how much of this, 
how, how, you know, I'm sure I've flicked too far forward again. We, we sort of explain things by saying, that's three swimming pools worth of beer. You know, this is like uh, a childish way, but in a way it explains abstract numbers to people. What tone should I use? Um, what might offend or alienate people? If you are a natural comedian, comedy is great. I love, I love good stand-up comedians. This is quite important, you know. So how do you hook people for an introduction? That's one of the things you can think about. Establish why your topic is important. Why are we doing this? Why are we trying to bring people in here? Um, bring in the point quite quickly. Repeat again, I've said this, I've explained this all right, already. Um, incorporate previews. Again, like I said, tell people I'm gonna give you three points and then give them the three points. Uh, that enables them to get things, to, to pay attention to things. And we come back to the, the transitions again. Now, I've said to you, you know, you, can, you, you might think is weird. How can I use comedy in some of these situations? I showed you a piece by James Acaster last week, who's one of my favorite British comedians. Now he wanted to talk, he wanted to talk about- A long time ago. He wanted to talk about British colonialism in the past. And that's a serious topic. You want people to think seriously about um, colonialism if you're giving a speech like this. Now he's not a political comedian. and he, he does do things for laughs, but I want you to look at this, look at the story here and look at how he uses comedy to make a you know i think i think uh, that's a very <laughs> i like that piece quite a lot i do, i want to end though um by uh what you'll be doing for this thing if you if you take part in the competition uh you'll be producing a video uh or and, and a presentation. I want to show you an assignment that somebody actually did for one of our earlier presentations. And I think um, I'm not, it's kind of quite topical and it's not using comedy. Um, you can actually use other kind of things. Now, if you're gonna use, you can use bits of film, you can use your presentation. Don't use two bits of film, long bits of film. I mean, keep it organized. I actually, had one student one year had to do a five minute presentation and she did a presentation about Chinese music of which three and a half minutes was a clip of Chinese music. Um, she's a good student, but this is not the way to, to organize things. You've got to have the content there. So I'm gonna end by showing you this, this one thing that somebody did last time. Um, and she's, I think she's using things fairly well. It's not funny, it's quite, emotional, quite strongly done. It uses story in certain aspects um, and it uses sort of various aspects of rhetoric. Uh, so let's quickly look at this to, to wind up the, the lesson. Hello everyone, I am Cassie. I am Chinese, but I am not a virus. Yesterday, I saw a video on the internet. It showed an Italian Chinese standing with mark and blindfold on the Italian street. A note next to him reads, I am not a virus, I am a human being. Please free me from prejudice. I was really shocked by that, and I want to know what's going on. And then I asked my friend study in England, the situation of Chinese student in there. She sent me a video and some message. She said, we are all afraid of wearing masks outdoor because people in England cannot understand us. They think we wear masks because we have got coronavirus. They stay away from us and even shout China virus in the public. She also said a few days ago, her friend walked on the street. Some young people in the England kind of provoked them and finally, some Chinese are enjoying. After read that, I was really upset. And let's see the video she showed us. Oh, oh, 
When I see this situation, I feel very upset. When we stay at home, they have suffered unexpected treatment abroad. What's more, the U.S. President Donald Trump called the coronavirus of China virus, saying it has affected U.S. industries. A majority of Twitter users expressed anger toward Trump's comment, saying that labeling the pandemic as a Chinese virus is racist. The new article of the German political weekly magazine is extremely misleading. The headline is written directly: "Coral virus is made in China." Australian media also refers to this virus as Chinese virus. I feel very sad and disappointed about this, so I want to stand up and share my opinion. First of all, things just happen. Criticism, insulting, blaming cannot change anything. Cannot stop the virus from spreading. I know everyone are panic because I also feel afraid at first. I'm afraid of being in fear with this disaster and transmitting it to others. But just because we are afraid, we lose the ability of judge right from wrong, so we cannot easily believe in some media report and blame this mistake on any nation. We are all community of human beings. We are all together. What we need to do now is thinking how we can defeat the disaster together. Let us isolate the virus, not isolate the human. In 2009, the outbreak of the H1N1 in Union State killed lots of people. But at that time, no one calls the virus as a U.S. virus. So why the virus appearing in China should be called China virus? Suppose you are Chinese in a foreigner country. Are you willing to suffer abuse on the street? If your answer is not, please don't treat the Chinese people like that. They wear masks to protect themselves and others. They are not warm. But some media are warm. They wrote some misleading article and put all the responsibility on Chinese people. Let's think about it. Is this virus only related to Chinese people? The flu in the Union States, the fire in Australia, and the African locust plague. Should these things happen normally? Shouldn't we reflect on ourselves? Everyone who lives on the earth. Including the Chinese and you before the screen should know that every disaster is closely related to us. Humans do a lot of things damage to the environment, so don't just blame on Chinese. Secondly, Chinese people work hard to fight with this disaster. They work hard, they believe, and they spare no effort. Zhong Nanshan, who is 84 years old. He still participated in some research activity in Wuhan. Within ten days, China built a hospital in Wuhan to isolate patient efficiently. Every people in China isolated themselves at home as much as they can. They try their best to avoid the virus to spread. This is not only my own opinion. The WHO organization also states that China has made a great contribution to the world. But when people around the world blame on Chinese, what China do? On March 14th, China planned to help Iran. On March 16th, China sent a medical team to Philippines and Italy. China try their best to make contribution to the world, so don't blame on Chinese. Let us fight against fires, not against China.
Okay, uh, hang on. I'm trying to get my lost my screen now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a few technical issues with that. The, the script, the speech is well written. I would advise you if you're doing something like that, don't get too close to the computer because it will make you a little bit cross-eyed uh, trying to look at the screen too much. Try and pull yourself back a little bit to do it like that. She's using the PowerPoint there fairly effectively. Um, it, it's... Um, not a bad example of how to use it because it's used for illustrative purposes. It's not words. It's not just echoing what she's saying. It's used for emotion. It's used for effect. It's used for strength. That's quite good. I mean, I'm not talking about the content of it. People may agree or disagree. I mean, from my point of view, those English thugs will pick on anybody for anything. And these days they're picking on anybody who's wearing a mask anyway, um, because like in America, the whole issue of whether to wear a mask or not has become quite socialized. And because whereas people in Asia tend to be uh, educated to be a bit more social, socially responsible, people in the West tend to be educated to push their individuality. And you know, that's made a difference. So again, you don't have to, in judging something, you don't have to agree with everything somebody says. That's not the point of good speech presentation. But in a way, you know, what's good about her presentation is that she's upset about it. She makes it clear. Her, her modulation of her voice is quite good. She's not reading it in a monotone. And so it all sort of works very uh, strongly to give her final message out. So again, I just want to come back to, to this finally, uh, coming back to um, the main things which I've talked about so far is to be memorable, have a structure, get, get off to a good start. People care a lot about the beginning and end of things. They'll forgive a little bit of... Uh, um, a sag in the middle, as long as, as they can get those things, strike the right tone. Like I said, it can be dramatic like Cassie. <coughs> it can be humorous like, like <coughs> James Acaster. You can still get your point over. Be personal. Repeat yourself where you need to. You can include props. Don't overdo it. I find uh, there's this organization called Toastmasters International that encourages people to how to speak and how to improve things. And um, I think they overdo the props very often and they, they sort of try and make it a little bit too entertaining. So you start to think that it's not really a very effective uh, thing. So basically, uh, now I can pass on, if you actually want comp copies of the, the PowerPoint uh, and what I've sort of talked about here. Uh, we've recorded the whole thing, so you can actually look back on it and see if there's any bits you've missed. Olivine can tell you a little bit more about what you need to do to enter the competition. Um, and uh, the, so the video of this is available, and if you want to, I can pass the PowerPoint on so that people can keep a copy of the PowerPoint to remind themselves. And, I think that's about it for, for now. Um, so I don't know whether um, Dr. Lowe wants to talk to you and, and explain a bit more about the project. 